Today I'm going to talk to you about the human side of technology. Four months ago, this is the day after the U.S. presidential election, I was in my office, and one of my patients who I've been working with for several months now, he walks in for his weekly therapy session. And he's visibly excited, happy. And as he sits down, up to this point, we have never spoken about politics in our sessions. But today he had a lot on his mind. He shared about immigration, he talked about the wall, he talked about radical Islamic terrorism. And as a therapist, as I'm sitting there, providing him the safe, non-judgmental space for him to share his thought, I start to get this feeling in my stomach. I'm Muslim American. I am involved in the community. I go around mosques, around the city, around the country, speaking, teaching, preaching. And in my mind, what came to me was several months ago in my community, a mother of three, 60 year old, was stabbed to death. What came to my mind was several months before that, an imam and a, his assistant were walking out of the mosque and they were gunned down. What came to my mind was my sister and my mother who wears a hijab. What came to my mind is my travelings in different communities across the country from Texas to Michigan, over 75 mosques that has been either vandalized or received threats. And what came to my mind was the young people that I speak with in conferences who tell me I don't feel like I belong here just because of the faith that I have. And so at that moment, as I was feeling this in my stomach, and I knew I had to do my job as a therapist, to be there for him, to have that non-judgmental space, I had to do two things. And so those are the two things that I want to talk to you about today. And I want to know these two words. Self-awareness, and number two, empathy. Self-awareness and empathy. We live in a world that's very technologically advanced. We have mass media, social media. We can talk to each other in very instant fashion. I know what's going on in a remote village in Africa, in a remote village in India. We know people's cultures, thoughts, ideas. We're exposed to the whole spectrum. But I don't think, my opinion, I, I don't think we as a people have become any more tolerant necessarily. We're more, we're more exposed to the ideas. But in some way, it has made us actually more boxed in. If each of you pulled out your face, Facebook and you went through a news feed, all of your news feeds look very different. You live in a whole different world. You have a whole life perspective, opinion. And so, if we are going to get along, if we are going to work together, whether it be with our family members, our cousin, our nephew, whether it be in an organization, whether it be at a company, whether it be as a country, we are going to need to learn how to understand our world and then be able to also appreciate someone else's work. Two words. What was two words? Self-awareness number two? Empathy. Empathy. Self-awareness. So as I was sitting there, I had to think about my own ideas and thoughts and where they came from. I had to think about the fact that I grew up around the mosque. I had to think about the fact that I grew up learning the Quran. I had to think about the fact that I'm a preacher. I have to think about the fact that my sisters and my mom were in the hijab. I have to know that. I have to acknowledge that. I have to know that my Facebook, most of the articles are how I reject Trump. And sometimes those articles 
and Earth's bias. I have to know that. I have to acknowledge that. I have to accept that. It began to be self-aware. So each and every one of you, when you're thinking about yourself, the ideas that you hold, the thoughts that you have, the experience that you went through as a child, the family that you grew up in, what you saw your parents doing, the social circle that you're around now, influence who you are. You're not at a unopinionated, balanced state. We all have our own boxes. We all live in our own boxes. As much as we think we're invited, we live in our box. And a matter of fact, the world is becoming more polarized because of the extensive amount of information. Your brain can actually process all that. It's too much. So I would rather just stick to my boxes a little more safer. So number one, being self-aware. Number two. Empathy. Empathy. You guys are very good. <laughs> number two is empathy. So empathy is being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and look at the world. How does it taste? How does it feel? How does it look? But I need your help. I want to demonstrate this to you. Who here is a ninth grader? Raise your hand. Ninth grader. Okay. I need one brave ninth grader. Keep your hand up. Very good. I see you. hand here. Oh, what in the blue? In the blue? Come on up. Uh, can I have a chair? One hand. You do say this. Alrighty. Who here is a teacher? Any teachers in the room? Teachers? Excellent. I need one great teacher. I need to borrow you for one. Come on. Alright. I'm going trust me so much, I haven't even told you what we're going to do, but he trusts me enough that he took a seat. Or maybe just a social pressure. But regardless, you're here. <laughs> Alrighty. Okay, so what we're going to do is a very simple experiment. What I would like you to do, what is your name? Mehdi. And you are? Danny. Danny. So we have Danny and Mehdi here. Obviously they come from different experiences, different background, different thoughts and ideas. Perhaps there are similarities because they're both in the same school. But there are big differences. Okay, so just for a moment, I need you to be Mehdi. And just for a moment, I need you to be your teacher. Okay, just for a moment. And I'm going to ask you some questions. And I'm, I want you to answer them as if you were him. And I want you to answer the questions as if you were him. Sounds like a plan? Okay, very good. So, um, your teacher here? Okay. So tell me this, if I went to your room, what are some things I will see? Students. <laughs> Wait a minute, you keep students in your room? <laughs> room in your house. A computer. A computer, keep going. All of my books. All of your books, what kind of books do you have? Textbooks. Textbooks? <laughs> he probably sleeps with textbooks, right? Never been <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, what else do you see in this room? Um, organized clothes. Organized clothes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, how much of that's true? Everything except the organized clothes. <laughs> so you figure you must be organized. Yeah, organized. Okay, okay. Alrighty, so again, we'll go back to your role. You're back to being a teacher. Alright, so you're mad now for a second. Okay. What is the craziest thing you have done? The craziest thing I've ever done, well, I don't really want to talk about it, it involves the elevator. Um, and, well, it was just, it was, I don't really want to talk about it. It involves the elevator, and it's not something I'm proud of. But, you know, it's, it's best left unsaid. I see, I see. The elevator and not part of it. Is that true? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty good. I think, I think the teachers know you well. Okay. So, uh, one more question, okay? Alright, so you're the teacher again. Okay? What is your dream vacation? Mm, um, again, your job is to put yourself in shoes and look at the world, taste the world, see the world, and try to, try to see what might be his favorite vacation spot. A getaway at Cancun. 
Cancun and Yerba. How true is that? That's really true. Um, I would like to be in Cancun by Sunday. <laughs> by Sunday. Okay. All right. And final question for you. You're many here. All right. So, what do you? When was the last time you cried? The last time I cried. It was back the last time I would admit I cried, or the last time I cried. Last time you cried. Okay, it was back in seventh grade, and the teacher, you know how we have those desks where we keep everything in? The teacher dumped my desk out because it was so sloppy in front of everybody, and I couldn't help it. I didn't want to cry, but the tears just came down because the teacher embarrassed me in front of everyone by dumping my desk, and he didn't have to do that, just because there were some old sandwiches in there. And stuff. Okay, and then how, how true is that? Very, very true. Very. Wow. My goodness. So. What did you have to do when you had to imagine yourself as being a teacher? What was going through you? Um, I just thought about different things that an adult would do. Oh, what an adult would do. And who would that be? What do you mean? Who are some adults in your life that are very emotional? Uh, parents. Parents. And what did you have to do to be able to look at the world and see what, how, how many you look at the world? Oh, wait, so he's my memory. I remember that I once was a kid. As far as I can tell. Very good. And, and what I will tell you is, you know, so most questions you got right, some you got wrong. And what that tells you sometimes we project also. So when we're doing this whole empathy thing, sometimes we do project our own self, right? And our experiences. At the same time, it also helps us when we look at the world and view the world. Thank you very much. Wonderful. What was number two? Empathy. Empathy. And so the second thing that I, that I, I leave you with this, when you are able to look at the world through perspective and view the world and feel the world, it allows, it allows you to connect. You know, in my office, I have, I have patients from age 5 to 75. I work in personal development coaching. I work with professionals from all different industries. And I have to be able to put myself in their shoes and view the world so I can help them, I can be with them. You know, I don't know what it means to be a young uh, woman who faces sexual uh, you know, harassment at work. I don't know that. But when my patient tells me that, I have to view the world. Just yesterday, I had a patient who told me about his journey. Three months it took from coming from Guatemala all the way to the Mexican border. Three months across Colombian you know, the, the jungles. And what it took and why it took that risk. And watching the dead corpse. And what it took from I have no experience that now. But I had to put myself in the shoes and view the world. And so, two things. Being able to know who you are and your own experiences, what you experience in your life, what you've been through, and how that shapes who you are, because you're not so unbiased. And number two, being able to put yourself in people's shoes. And if we did that, and when we interacted with our family members, when we interact with our colleagues, when we interact with our classmates, when we interact as a community, if we did those two things, I think we can begin to have more empathy for people, more understanding of people, we can humanize people. And so, if you are against Trump, I want you to go to Trump's page, his Facebook page, and I want you to play, look at those comments. And those who are saying, God bless you, and, and they have a picture of him with the angel, I want you to click on those profiles. Kind of creepy. But I want you to click on the profile, go into their pro public profile, and look at their families. Look at their life. Look at their wants, desire, and, and, and view them as a human being. And if you are for Trump, I want you to go to a young Muslim and go to his profile and look at his life, look at his family, and humanize him. If we can begin to humanize each other, maybe then we can stop the war in our household, stop the arguments in our companies, and maybe as a community we can also get along with each other. Thank you very much.